glad to present today um, the Mendocino Maidens and Mavens and Mavericks. And we have with us here one of them. Hopefully, <laughs> 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 we got that right. That is absolutely right. <laughs> Molly Dwyer. Um, Molly is a writer and she writes fiction as well as nonfiction. She moved to the coast. Oh, 30 years ago or so, and has always considered this to be her home. Uh, she is a professor at the Mendocino College of Ethics and uh, lives in Fort Bragg. She became interested in uh, women and writing about women uh, with her first novel, which uh, was, is named Requiem. And when it was published in, in 2009, it made the short list of one of the five best novels published that year. In Northern California, not in the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to And then after that, uh, she did research of historical Paris and decided to um, write about women whose contributions and accomplishments had largely been buried and forgotten in history. So that was an, another novel that she produced. And uh, then about three years ago or so, she attended a workshop that the Kelly House put on to um, help people who wanted to write using the archives of the museum. And that's how Molly first became acquainted with us here. And um, now she is writing a novel about Mendocino and the Kelly family and hopes to have it finished um, next summer. So, uh, let's give a warm welcome to Molly, and Wow, thank you. <laughs> I was expecting, you know, eight or ten people. So. <laughs> Before I start, I, I, want to, um, I want to thank someone that's here, Betty Duke. She, Betty is the person who put all of this together. Would you just stand up and she is the artist. <laughs> we were talking the other day and I said and she said to me, "Well, I really appreciated working with you. I really appreciated your contribution." And I said, "Betty, you have shown off my words. You have created this beautiful environment for my words and I am very grateful." So I just think she's done a tremendous job. And yes, uh, the, the thing that got me started really was uh, Requiem was about Mary Shelley at a time when she wasn't very well known. And then I was, I was given um, recognition for writing women back into history. And that recognition came from the political women's, National Women's Political Caucus, the Mendocino branch of it. And that got me going. <clears throat> and I really do feel like I have this kind of incredible passion about bringing women to light who have been, you know, I mean, when you start researching women, it's very, it's kind of remarkable. I think you should turn the screen on, right, Doug? Yeah, but it's on. <laughs> Just, uh, what a blast. <laughs> OK, go ahead. Okay. This was my nightmare version that Doug's running the screen for me <laughs> 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 instead of me running it. OK. So I, I want to talk about women, and I want you just to flick through the first like six slides here as I'm talking at your, at your leisure, okay? So what, the thing about talking about women and looking for them is that it's just really hard to find information. A lot of it is supposition, which is why I like writing fiction. You get little tidbits. And the thing about Mendocino women is that there are so many interesting tidbits. I mean, Mendocino is peopled with women who did remarkable things. And, and for all of us, I actually came here originally in the 70s. And I've been in and out of this community since then. And I've always thought of Mendocino as my home. And for those of us who do, these are our foremothers, you know. <laughs> this is the roots out of which we grow. These are the women who shape this community. And some of them are nameless. Some of them were shopkeepers. Some of them simply survived. Some of them were discriminated against because of their ethnic background. Some of them were mavericks who took, you know, 
really bold steps and did really unusual things. One young woman, you know, went off to be an opera star. Another woman went off to be a pharmacist. Some of these women were born here. <laughs> And, and <laughs> yes, these are all local Kelly, girl, Kelly House women who, who were the real mavericks of the town, and we'll talk about that. <laughs> so I'm going to start at the, begin at the end, essentially, instead of at the beginning. I'm going to start with Emmy Lou Packard, who is the most recent of these women to really shape. <coughs> Is that better? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> All this technical stuff is beyond me here. Okay. One more thing. If these two people would change spots, it would be perfect because all I have is his head. If you, you're shorter, if you guys wouldn't mind switching places. You too. You too. Yeah, you too. For the camera. Is that all right? No, no. Is that better? Oh, yeah. Are we ready to roll? <laughs> I'm rolling anyway. Okay. So, Emmy, Emmy Lou Packard <clears throat> is the most recent woman to bring uh, shape and um, history to, to Mendocino of the women that I'm talking about today. Um, when I first read about Emmy Lou, I started crying. That was my reaction because I realized that without her, Mendocino would not be the town that I love and hold dear. Because what Emmy did, Emmy, first of all, if you recognize the artist in this picture, when she was 13, she went to Mexico and she met Frida Kahlo and, and Diego Rivera and <clears throat> became close associates with them. And she thinks of herself as an, uh, as an artist primarily. And these are both images of hers. Um, if you can tell, it's hard to see on this, but this is Mendocino. The Mend here's the bay, and there's the point, right? This is her work. And she came to Mendocino somewhere around eight, 1959, maybe 1960, right in there, shortly after Bill Zock had arrived. And I like to think that maybe part of the reason she came was because Bill had come, had started the Art Center, and was trying to get artists here. He was trying to make this into an artist community. So whatever brought her here, what she says is that when she arrived and she looked out at this beautiful land out here, she realized that it was going to become commercial if something didn't happen. And <laughs> she immediately responded to that level, and it's good she did, because apparently already there were negotiations going on to sell that property. Boise Cascade owned it at the time, and it had gone through the hands, it started out belonging to the Mendocino Lumber Company, and it had gone through a number of lumber um, magnets to, to, until Boise owned it. And they agreed after nine years, first of all, all the citizens, we owe the entire population of Mendocino in the 50s and early 60s, uh, you know, our heartfelt thanks because all those people got on board with her. They had a petition drive. She went to Washington, D.C. She worked behind the scenes politically. She negotiated with the state. She negotiated with the, the lumber company, and finally she got the state on one side and the lumber company on the other side to agree to a swap. And Boise Cascade took land in Jackson Forest, and the land that, was going, that belonged to them was given to the state, and it was turned into a park. And if it wasn't turned into a state park, we would be looking at a, at a community of private homes and industries all across the headlands. But instead, we look at State Park. So hats off to Emmy Lou. <laughs> Two other women who also need to be recognized right up front are Dozy Bear and Beth Stebbins. They came about in 19, uh, oh, about 1970, 1969, right at the end of this period. They're responsible for the Kelly House existing. They, they, re Beth with a, you know, you can see her right here in this picture holding a crowbar with her own hands. She was, she was taking this place and, re and, and restoring it. They also were, they talked, they also politi you know, worked politically. Dorothy, this is Dorothy and this is Beth. Dorothy, they'd been together as a couple for like 25 years living in Palm Springs when they came up here to retire. <laughs> 
And she was a librarian ahead of that. And when, what happened was she <clears throat> started kind of working in the library and meeting people. And as she moved into the community of, of um, individuals who had lived here a long time, the old timers, she got really fascinated. And she started. I'm not used to having to stand in one place. Could you give me the water? I do a little Marco Rubio here. <laughs> okay. Um, she was, she started interviewing people essentially and gathering information. And because of her librarian background, she started cataloging it. And that's one of the amazing things about the Kelly House that you learn when you start working here is how much information is here and how much work has been done over these last whatever years to get it in an order where someone like me coming in can actually find what they're looking for and find what they have available. And she started that whole thing. So the, between the two of them, they started the historical society that, that preserved this place. And it put in motion the energy that, I'll, that led to the state declaring this a, um, a, what is it called? It's a national uh, historical landmark, the whole town. The whole town of Mendocino is a historical landmark. And these two women, who also met with Nanny Escola, who I'll talk about in just a second, who's also kind of the fourth leg on the, on the, on the stool of, of these four women who really uh, made what's happening today possible. Um, they just basically put in motion everything necessary to make this place exist. And they found donators and people who were uh, willing to get on board and create this incredible resource for the community. And that was what they did in their retirement. <laughs> and I just find that <laughs> typical of Mendocino. <laughs> we retire up here to do even more than we were doing in our life. So onward. So really briefly, quickly, I didn't know when I came here that Mendocino, you know, uh, was basically came into existence in some way because of the, the frolic shipwrecked off the Cabrillo coast. And I know I'm talking to an audience that probably knows more about Mendocino history than I do, but it, it wrecked in 1850. And in it, but what happened was that the Pomo, especially after it wrecked and, they, and the people got out and went down, it was an American ship. It was actually built in Baltimore. It was a very interesting ship because it was running opium in the, uh, between India and China before it came on its trip from China to San Francisco. And the investors had decided because they were losing money on the opium trade because of the um, because steamer ships could move faster, <coughs> that um, they would run what they called chow chow from China to San Francisco. And chow chow was anything and everything from, you know, wooden umbrellas and, and blue and white pottery to uh, Edinburgh uh, beer. And I don't know exactly, ale, and I'm not sure exactly how that got to China, but it came from China here. <laughs> so it crashed here in July of 1850. And uh, by, by July of 1855, the settlers, the settlers who had, go ahead, the settlers who had come up to find out, a guy named Miggs had sent Jerome Ford up here to see what was going on. And Jerome Ford was smart enough to look around and say, Redwoods, that's what's going on up here. And so by 1855, um, well, actually, by 1852, they were up here. And by 1855, everything was established. And among those who came in that first ship, which was called the Ontario, was William Kelly. And so he was one of the original settlers here. Eliza was not with him at that time. He was an unmarried man. So next slide. So they moved the site. You saw the, the mill out there on the headlands. They moved it to the mouth of Big River because it was just impossible to use that site successfully up there on the headlands. But there was a, if, if you go back one minute, see this is, if you look up here, there's, there's like a shoot, this is the point, there's a shoot, what was called a shoot house. And if you go back now, I should have shown that. That's why I like to run my own set. One more. Go, go forward. Go forward. <laughs> this is why it's my nightmare version. <laughs> this is how they came ashore from ships. This is the passengers. This was the early version of it. You just sat on that plane <laughs> and hoped you didn't fall. <laughs> and then when it got updated, upgraded, you got a little basket. 
to sit in. And, and they had these chutes that ran out. I called them chutes to nowhere, but they were like flying buttresses sticking out into the water that they used to, to run the, lu uh, the lumber down from the headlands onto the ships. But this was called a dog hole. That's fine. This was called a dog hole inlet because it's so shallow and the cliffs are so steep that there's no way to have a decent uh, wharf or any kind of system here. So the going on with the women, Moving forward here, what happened, of course, is as soon as the Europeans arrived, the Pomo's <laughs> lifestyle was completely disrupted. And they had been using the area right to the north of Big River and the mouth of Big River as their summer camps, where they came in the summer. They lived in the winter, they lived inland near Ukiah in that area, and in the summers they came out here and they fished. And, <clears throat> and of course, as the Europeans came, their lifestyle began to get more and more compromised and destroyed. And the women of the Pomo, we have almost no names or information of individual women. Um, a lot of them, what happened particularly in the winter of, of uh, 57, of 1857, was a very bad winter. And a lot of starvation started to happen and there was cattle rustling and robbery. From the, from the Pomo uh, to the, you know, taking stuff from the settlers. And the settlers got up in arms and signed a petition that said that they wanted, you know, a war of extinction against the Pomo. And, and that's when what happened was they petitioned the government and the government came up here and built um, a reservation that sort of went from Noyo all the way up to about 10 Mile and Fort Bragg was established in 1857 to look, out, look after it. And the women were in some ways, you know, I went back and forth between saying they had the hardest time and then thinking, well, maybe they had an easier time because they had a couple of options. <coughs> the, they could work as domestics. And those who were lucky enough, I guess, that's the right answer, the right way to put it, could marry a European. And two women, uh, go ahead, and you can see from this picture how you can see the influence of Western, of, of European civilization kind of beginning to infiltrate the way they think and act and dress and try and fit in to work. Because if they weren't on the reservation, they basically had to have some kind of, either they were on the lamb or they had to have some kind of domestic relationship with a family here that was essentially sheltering them. The Kellys had a servant named Boucher, who I'm quite fascinated with as I write about him, who seemed to have been with them there his entire life almost. And uh, it says that William Kelly rescued him from some kind of disaster, which I think was probably because he had robbed and they were going to kill him and William Kelly rescued him. But one more slide here. Um, well, I guess I should have stayed there. But, the, but the, <coughs> the one story that we do have of names of the early women were um, there's a woman who was either named Mary or Sarah. And <laughs> You can tell that's an Ang anglicized name that she changed her name and she was married to Nat Smith who was the only African American that I'm aware of who lived here in the 1850s and he was down here on the river. He ran the, he ran the um, ferry before there was a bridge and <coughs> apparently Mary was called a wildcat and she stabbed him in the throat one day. <laughs> Missed his juggler, which is why he lived, and there was also someone there who got the knife out of her hand and uh, got a physician there and saved Nat. Nat. But uh, the rumor was that he was, you know, dallying around with his stepdaughter, which was maybe her daughter or somebody in the, in the immediate family, and he hotly denied it. But that's one of those juicy little tidbits that <laughs> <laughs> rolls around in the Kelly world in the Kelly House archives and you wonder, is that true? <laughs> what happened there? So Mendocino Maidens, next slide. Mendocino Mavens and Mendocino Mavericks. And <clears throat> these are the most maverick of the mavericks in my opinion. These were the soiled doves, the ladies of the night. <laughs> and, and what you can't see here, but in this little, where this arrow points is the Buffalo Saloon. And behind the Buffalo Saloon, and this was pretty common, was um, a bordello. And it, because there were so many loggers with money and, and you know, no women, there were, when Eliza came, Eliza Kelly came, there were very few other women here. 
The, the what women were here, what this was a good place for was prostitution. A lot of women, I think, may have, this is my thinking about it, that they left San Francisco because this was a nicer, gentler place to be a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty rough and tumble in San Francisco, and it was a little easier here. And I think more women who uh, came up here had, had a chance of, of surviving. And it was everything from fashionable boarding houses, they called them. Over here on the corner of Caston and, uh, what is it, Ukiah, right? The little yellow house with the white picket fence. That used to be called Miss Molly's fashionable boarding house. <laughs> <laughs> I got very interested in that. It was owned by a woman named Catherine Coyle. She purchased that property. I suspect Catherine was the madam, but I don't know. I suspect it because lots of times those women changed their name to, you know, took on an alias to make sure their families didn't know what they were doing. But there was a wonderful, <laughs> I call it wonderful, I'm a writer. There was a wonderful story there, a terrible story there about a murder, a double murder. And <clears throat> what happened was that one of the prostitutes there and her client were gunned down one night in the 1860s. And that, um, okay my hand in the ship in the way. And that uh, the Beacon reported this story. This is where research gets very interesting. The Beacon reported this story some years later in, re in one of their retrospectives as being uh, the wife came in and, and killed uh, the husband and his lover, right? But when I did some more research on it, unfortunately, that wasn't what they reported at the time. What they reported at the time was that this fellow that was shot was an actor from San Francisco. And <clears throat> the woman who came up with him or was with him probably was an actress from San Francisco originally, too. And they may have been living together. They may have even been married. But they came up here, and some other man who was reported in the Sacramento paper, who I have no in information of what his relationship was to these people, is who shot them dead. But I know that she jumped in front of the gun to try and stop him from shooting. I think he was after Frank. <laughs> I think he and Frank may have had, you know, issues. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So back to Nanny. Um, I'm going to go through a really quickly here some school teachers. And Nanny is the quintessential, no, stop. <laughs> Nanny is the quintessential school teacher. Um, she's also, like I said, the, the uh, important person who's like the fourth rung on that stool of women who, who made this uh, world of the Kelly House happen. And uh, she contributed something like 700 photographs and like 30 uh, files of information, you know, just incredible amount of information. She began as a young woman. She liked to collect stamps. That was the first thing she ever collected. And she went, when she, she married, uh, uh, what's his name, John? Is it John? John, John Escola. And, <coughs> and had six children. And she stopped teaching in order to raise her children, but when her youngest was a toddler, ready to kind of make it on her, its own of it, she went back to teaching. I think she really loved teaching. And she, I, the first time I ever heard of her, I thought she was a history teacher. Obviously, she was a teacher that taught everything. She was in a one-room schoolhouse in, in Little River, but her interest in history was was um, dominant. It's what drove her. And she did a lot of interviewing. She did a lot of writing. She did a lot of, of collecting of information about the people who she came in contact with. She was born in 1885. And so she had a, a lot of contact either with the old timers or with people who knew the old timers. And, uh, and she said in the end that she got into doing this because she had to stay, once her husband died, she had to stay out of her kid's hair. <laughs> and she also, she was, I love some of her quotes, and the one that is in my mind that I remember off the top of my head is she said something along the lines of that she couldn't say the Lord's Prayer because the Lord's Prayer says you have to forgive those that have done harm to you, and she couldn't do that because some pe she was just too mean to do that. She says some people, <laughs> you just couldn't forgive them, so she couldn't say the Lord's Prayer because of that. Okay, next. So Emma Coombs Barton is actually not here, but I thought she was worth mentioning. She also, she looks like a Gibson girl to me. She's so cute. She, she was one of the uh, many school teachers who actually graduated from Mendocino High School in the 1890s, went to Ukiah to Miss Pittman's uh, normal school over there and, and, and was certified to be a teacher. Ms. And 
came back and taught here, and she married into the Coombs, uh, into the Barton family. She was, I think I have that backwards. I think she married into the Coombs family. But anyway, the people who, who uh, were the aristocracy of Little River, who basically founded the, the Little River Inn and built the Little River Inn with Silas Coombs, uh, which was her, like her uncle-in-law, if you will. Next slide. Emily Etta Pullen, also known as Etta Stevens Pullen, she was also a school teacher. She's best known and she's kind of highlighted in here for the fact that she kept a diary. One of the very few women who uh, did, and at least that we have here, it, and I found it just fascinating to read from her diary. Um, she did a really good job of talking about what was going on around her. Um, she, when she was young, <coughs> uh, young, first married, they were living, she married uh, his name was Wilder Pullen. She called him Wild. And she was madly in love with him. You can tell that from her diary. As, and as a matter of fact, the only time she stopped writing in her diary was after he died, when uh, for seven years she didn't write towards the end of her, or not even the end of her life, but he lived, she outlived him by about 15 years, something like that. I think so. No, then the dates must be wrong. So it's back there. I I apologize. I got the dates wrong. Um, she <laughs> see. I need an editor. She um, <laughs> somebody to ask me that question besides my cat. <laughs> <laughs> That's a solo. <laughs> anyway, yes. Etta, um, she talked about, the, the, he's the, Pullen is the guy who built the house that is now the Heritage House. And they lived there for quite a while. And she talks about in her journal looking out from, from the uh, windows of her home there and seeing Albion burn. And seeing the whole town of Albion burn. And she also reported, she's one of the few people who reported the 1906 earthquake up here which I thought was rather remarkable. And you feel from her writing that two things happened to people up here. The first thing that happened is they had to recover from the earthquake itself. Mendocino did get quite a shake. The, there was a, a big smokestack you know, down there at the, at the mouth of Big River for the mill that, was, that came tumbling down. And that's part of the reason. And the shoot house fell in. And all the buildings fell in. From, and that's part of the reason why it all the mill disappeared from Mendocino. But, but not only did people have to recover, they knew that what was happening in San Francisco. They were worried. And she writes about not hearing from some of the people she loves and they're like wondering if they're alive. And hearing that San Francisco was a ruin and just being, you know, just stunned and appalled. I remember in the 89 when they said the Bay Bridge was down. I was in the East Bay when they said on the radio that the Bay Bridge was down. And I had this image in my mind of the entire Bay Bridge being gone. And I literally went into shock. I stopped being able to function. And I think something like that happened here. That there, that understanding of what was happening to San Francisco was so strong that people were just torn, not only by what had happened to them, but what was happening to this, this city that they were so close to and closely connected. And she wrote about that and captured it really well. Next slide. So one other teacher of a different elk. This is Laura Nelson Lemmers. Lemmers. And she was, um, she was Augie Heezer's cousin. Augie Heezer was, uh, took over the beacon from his father, William Heezer, and he ran it for years and years and years, right? He, she was his cousin. And what uh, he, William Heezer did was he hired her when she was a young girl, about 19, to uh, teach, uh, to hold a private school. He, he funded an entire private school for the Chinese population here because the, st the laws were such that, that Chinese children could not be in public school. So I see things, I keep coming across little things like that, and I always, it always kind of warms my heart that there were people like that in Mendocino doing, making those kind of choices. Okay, next slide. Because there's not a lot about the Chinese population here, but there definitely was one. And the one woman that we know by name is Fang Sung Chow, and she was the wife of John Lee, that's how he was called. It's John Singh Lee, I think, is, is the full name. And he is the one who built the Taoist temple over here, he and his wife. And these are their two daughters. I've not seen a picture of her, but there's her, her two daughters. They raised four children. 
uh, William Heiser also sold them the property that they built on Albion Street, that they built this on. They paid $12 worth of redwood to build that place. <laughs> it's Dallas. And I thought, <coughs> in my mind, these people, especially uh, John, he must have come looking for some kind of religious freedom because you don't, you don't build a Taoist temple just, you know, when you, you build a house or you build something, you know, personal. You don't build a Taoist temple unless it really matters to you. And what, they came from the Cantoon area. Um, they weren't married when they came. She was, <coughs> she was, for Fong Sung, it was very unusual for a young Chinese woman to come. Most of them were trafficked. The vast majority of young Chinese women who came here were trafficked and living in San Francisco in terrible circumstances. It's not my phone. <laughs> <laughs> and so the fact that she came at about age 16 is really quite remarkable. And she must have been fleeing either for religious reasons or just for the violence. Because in that area, which was around where Hong Kong is looking across towards Canton, that whole region was really in civil war at the time. And there was kind of a strange cult that had arisen that was a perverted version of Christianity that was killing everybody who wasn't converting. And so I think they came uh, for those reasons. And there were seven junks that set out, you know, J Chinese junks that set out. Only two of them made the voyage. They were headed for Monterey. Hers, she and her family were on the one that landed in Monterey. John Lee, John Sing Lee was on the one that went off course and landed in Casper. <laughs> and that's how he ended up here. And William Kelly, to his... Uh, to his credit, uh, gave John Lee a, a job working as a cook at the a Casper Lumber Company. And as soon as, as Hung Sung Chow learned, which was about two years later, that he was alive, that he had actually made it, she was up here. Mm -hmm. And she married him. And they had kids. So I figured she was in love with him when she came, even though she wasn't married to him. She was 16. Next slide. Another ethnic group. This is uh, Guadalupe. Lupe. Feliz Gordon. She was uh, Mexican in, in her heritage and actually some Pomo Indian. Her mother was part Pomo and that family kind of hid that because it was even more uh, difficult to be known for Pomo roots than it was for Mexican roots. But the Mexicans, as you know, had controlled California and had a lot of power and her family had been one of the very powerful families before California became a state and the Mexicans lost it, control of it. But by the time she was born, they were in dire poverty. They'd lost everything. And she grew up around Hopland. She, you can see what a beautiful woman she was. She followed her. She was known as a great horsewoman. And I think she was known as a great sexual symbol. <laughs> the guys all went, whoa. But she came over here following her brother, who went to work in one of the mills. And she, for her first job was working for Daisy McCallum. She worked as a domestic for Daisy McCallum. Then she went a little bit later in, as a secretary uh, she, where she worked for um, a Mendocino Lumber Company. And down the road from where she worked, Hank or Henry, I think his name was Henry Gordon. I have all these notes that I'm not using. Henry Gordon um, was working in the livery stables there. And uh, he just saw her one day and went, that's it. And against all of his family's wishes for marrying someone other than white, he married her. And they, uh, uh, she became Lupe Felice Gordon. And <coughs> she's, she was quite an interesting lady. She ran an ad in the Mendocino Beacon at one point, um, about two-thirds of the way through her marriage, that basically said, anybody who gives my husband drink has <laughs> 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 got to answer to me. <laughs> she ran that in the Mendocino Beacon. And then a little while later, she ran another ad in the Mendocino Beacon that said, you know, my son has left home, and any debts that he acquires, I'm not responsible for. <laughs> In the end, when her husband died, she outlived her husband by about 15 years, too. When he died, um, he left the house to his, his son instead of to her. And she raised money. I'm not sure how she did it, how much she had, but she raised money to buy it. She bought it from her son, and she owned it for the rest of her life. So that's Guadalupe. Next. So the Mendozas, another ethnic group, the Portuguese, they came from the Azores, which are about 800 miles off the Portugal coast. They were not married when they came either. Uh, Isabel came with her brothers and maybe some other members of her family. She, uh, 
I don't know how she got to Mendocino. It's not really clear what brought them up here. But she married Frank Mendoza. Uh, and I had the feeling from what little I saw that she, too, might have known him before she came. He used to work in the whaling ships in the Azores. So he, was a, he had been on the same, uh, in the same world that she had been in. They came from the same place. These are their daughters, a couple pictures of their daughters. He worked in the mill. He had a terrible accident. He lost his arm. And at that point, the family had to do something else to uh, survive. And that's when they started scrambling. They had a saloon for a while. They had a chop house for a while. And ultimately, they were delivering vegetables and fruits and things like that around town. And then they opened Mendoza's. Mm -hmm. And Mendoza succeeded. And the daughters were like the cooks for the chop house. It was a family enterprise. And the way that I see Isabel from what I've read about her is I think she was a spiritual center of that family. I think she's what held that family together through it all because they, they had a lot of um, struggle. They struggled hard to make that work. Next slide. Now, this character, this is not actually a picture of Cinderella. It's another, I, Cinderella, as far as I know, there's no pictures of her, but Cinderella is one of my favorite Maverick characters. Cinderella, they think she's half, a pa, uh, half Comanche. She, Cinderella's, uh, I found no other indication that Cinderella was a, an alias. I think this was the name she was given. Gilbert was her unmarried name, so I think her mother might have been a half-breed, too, or something like that, or maybe her, her, yeah, her father and mother, maybe what I guess I meant by that is she was a half-breed. Her mother married a, a white man, I think, and so she had the last name Gilbert. She came up here, and the rumor, she came up here in about 1860s, maybe 1865 or so, somewhere around in there. And there's two different trains of, of thought about what she did when she got up here. One says she became a domestic. The other says she became a prostitute. In any event, <coughs> she survived. She met a man who changed his last name. His first name was Ruckert, I think. Or his last name was originally Ruckert. He changed it to Wallace. I don't know why. But she became Cinderella Gilbert Wallace. He built the house that's over there across from the Evergreen uh, Cemetery that's now the Mendocino Realty. And she lived in that house. And she was an outsider the whole time she was here. She wasn't accepted into the society of Mendocino, right? But, and, she, and she made her living pretty much by selling things like apples and you know, various medicinals and, and fruits and vegetables and things like that. And there's several really funny stories about her, my favorite being that there was some guy that wandered through the Evergreen Cemetery on his way home from being drunk at the saloon, probably the Buffalo Cafe on Main Street, or the Buffalo Saloon, I mean. And he'd wandered through there every night, really late in the middle of the night, singing at the top of his lungs, drunk out of his mind, and it just would wake her up, and it drove her nuts. And so one night she went, and there was an, an open grave that hadn't been, uh, nobody, been <laughs> nobody had been buried yet, and she hid in that grave, and she covered herself up with sheets, <laughs> things like that. And when the guy walked by, she jumped out, and she let out this war hoop, war whoop. <laughs> and it scared the living bejesus out of the guy, and he ran away, and he never came back again. He said he found a different route. To take <laughs> and then I read, and this is part of what is interesting, that the Comanche had a tradition in their, in their uh, child-rearing practices where when they were uh, trying to discipline a child who wouldn't behave, they would use a war hoop to scare them. They would scare them into behaving with this war hoop. So I think that's what she was doing. And uh, <clears throat> she was, you know, she left money to an orphan. She left all of her money to an orphanage in the end. She was a really big-hearted woman who uh, I think deserves um, our affection. <laughs> Next slide. Belle Lynch, um, Bet is the one who put up all the information about Belle. Bet has been uh, fascinated with Bell for some time. She was a publisher. She, her husband, Matt Lynch, published the Independent Dispatch for a time and then died, and she took it over. And this is true of a lot of women who took over businesses from their husbands and for one reason or another because they died or couldn't do it. And she became Mrs. Bell Lynch, publisher of the Independent Dispatch. And when you read about what they say about her as a publisher, she uh, apparently was quite drawn to spicy things, and she liked to publish them. So I think it was a, you know, a bit like um, People magazine or something <laughs> of the day. <laughs> yeah, and this is not her. This is a picture of Nellie Bly, who was a journalist during that time, very famous woman journalist. And I just thought maybe, you know, there's some 
relationship there between at least how she saw herself, not so much what we looked at, what she looked like. There's no pictures apparently that we've found of her. Next slide. America Jane Elliott, I love the name. She came across to, uh, from Missouri on a wagon train, and she, her father was part of, the, uh, they ended up <coughs> in Sonoma County. Her father was part of the Bear Flag Revolt, which is, you know, that really he was fighting Pomo, he was fighting the Mexicans, he was a, a wild frontiersman. And she married a man very similar to him who took her up to Red Bluff where she lived and she raised six children with him. And while she was up there, she started making gloves. She was making these Spanish leather gloves. She was, uh, she was taking the hide, the deer hide, and embroidering them. And they were real, uh, the rich people were buying them. They, she got $500 apparently for, I don't know how many pair of gloves because it must have been more than one because that's so much money. But her husband took that money, he, she gave him the gloves to deliver, and he took that money and he spent it all in one night drinking. And she packed up her six children and said, that's it. <laughs> and she came to Mendocino. And I don't know what brought her here except that Mendocino had a reputation as a stagecoach town. It was kind of a, an interesting town because it, you know, the, the ships came up here on their way up as far as Seattle, and it was a stagecoach route, and so it may have seemed like a central location to her. But in ever, for whatever reason, she came here and she opened a milliner shop and a, a, a dress shop as well. And this is not a picture of it, but it might have looked something like this. And, and she was very successful. She lived in the Jarvis uh, Nichols building, which is now where out, the Bank of America used to be and now out of this world. And she would... No, the other one. The other one, the gallery bookstore. I keep doing that. The gallery bookstore is there. Yes, I'm sorry, again. <laughs> I got that in my head and I can't get it out. Um, but she lived there and she was so successful at what she did that her son was able to buy it. And instead of being a tenant, she became, he became the owner of it. So that's America. Estelle Clark Preston, Preston Hall, she married Dr. Preston. She, she trained as a nurse. Uh, she graduated, she was one of the naughty aughts, I didn't mention that, but there was this group of young women who graduated from Mendocino High School in, actually in 1901. And they, we figured they maybe called themselves the naughty aughts because they started their senior year in 1900. Ought meaning zero, right? The naughty aughts. And she was one of them and, there were <coughs> and they all went off and did, a, uh, a number of them went off and did interesting things. She, this was at a time when nursing, the nursing profession was just opening up to women. And right before um, she and Preston married, they were, they were engaged and about to get married when the San Francisco earthquake hit. And they went out into the streets. They were in the Bay Area at the time and made quite a, a reputation for themselves helping people. And then they came back up here. Next. Kate Kenny Gorman, this is not a picture of Kate. I'm sure there's one around here, but I didn't find it. The reason I put that phone up there, that picture up there is that not only did Kate run this, this um, hotel, this, which was across the street here on the, on the south side of Maine, over it's sort of where just e uh, east of the Ford House in that area, wow. right? And, and her husband had purchased this and was running it, and he died. She took it over. She was the proprietress of it for almost 40 years, something like that. And she also ran the telephone exchange out of it, and she also ran a parcel post out of it. So she's a busy woman. And she, she kept it going until it burned down. And <laughs> she kept it going until it burned down, which was, I think, in the 1940s. Next slide. So this is a couple of more, a couple of more of those naughty aughts. <clears throat> this is Edith, uh, Edith Nichols and Ethel Nelson. They were cousins, and I called them the Carson cousins because their, par their mothers were the Carson twins, Katie Carson and, and Bessie, Elizabeth Carson. And they were twins who lived in the Carson Hotel, which was down here on Main Street, probably opened in the late 1850s, and uh, burned in 1870, and they rebuilt it. And they ran the dining room. These, these two young women, uh, the Carson girls, had a reputation all around town because they were so sought after. And there's a wonderful story about Katie I, that I really like. She, for those of you who know the story of the Mendocino Outlaws, there's not really time to go into it, but he went out in the posse chasing down the Mendocino Outlaws, and one of uh, the posse was killed. He was injured. They brought him back to the Carlson Hotel and laid him out. Katie started nursing him. A couple years later, they married. <laughs> 
and Edith was their daughter, <coughs> and Edith was the one who wanted to be a, uh, an opera singer, and she had quite a voice, and um, she was, you can see what a beautiful woman she was, too. And she lived much of her life in New York. Augie Heiser was madly in love with her his entire life. And he finally talked her into marrying him when she was about 70. <laughs> <laughs> Prior to that, she traveled with a companion, another woman who was in her life that whole time. So we've been speculating about that. But she studied in Europe. Uh, and one of the and and she made her living very comfortably in New York teaching music. She uh, she didn't make it on the stage. I mean, she would get smaller parts, but she didn't make it as a diva because she didn't have the she had the, she didn't have the ability to project enough. But she had a beautiful voice. Her cousin Ethel became a pharmacist, and Ethel worked in Oakland in the in uh, the at Merritt Hospital essentially, and. Um, she was active politically and, and agitated a great deal trying to get changes in the system for women who were working in the medical field because they weren't allowed to work the same kind of hours that men were. There were all these kind of discriminatory things because they were women. And she was a fighter for that. And, neither, and she never married. Um, next slide. Teresa Murray. Teresa Murray and her daughter Susie. I didn't find a picture of Susie. Teresa actually was born in Ireland. Uh, came over here with her husband. Or no, she came over here without her husband. She married Jay, Jay, um, Murray. Um, I think his first name was James. I can't remember now. But um, <coughs> she married him, and he opened the first farm. J.D., they called him. It was John. That's what he was. J.D. He opened the first pharmacy here. So there was actually a pharmacy here in Mendocino, which may have influenced Ethel. I don't know. It was earlier. But he opened the first pharmacy, and he was more or less the doctor at the same time, like a surgeon. And he died. She took it over. And she ran it, and she called it, um, you know, Mrs. J.D., uh, Murray and Company, uh, and it was a mercantile store. She expanded the, the, from just pharmacy into all sorts of different kinds of things. She ran it quite successfully. She died in 1906, right after the earthquake. She was living in Oakland at the time with her daughter, Susie. Susie's story is kind of uh, fascinating and I think tragic. I'm not really sure. She was divorced, and I thought a, a Catholic girl getting divorced in the in the 1890s, that seems pretty radical. And she lost her daughter when she was nine years old. And Teresa, she would, the daughter was named Teresa as well as the grandmother. She's buried here next to her grandparents. And Susie did remarry. But the story I like about them the best is they were coming back from San Francisco or the Bay Area on stagecoach. And uh, the, the stagecoach was robbed. And so it was stopped by a bunch of apparently bumbling robbers, the kind of you know, um, Saturday Night Live would write about. And <clears throat> they were in a quandary about what to do about the women, because in order to get them to get out of the stage, they would have to handle them. They'd have to put their hands on them, which would be totally improper. And for some reason, these robbers were afraid to be improper. <laughs> <laughs> And so they started negotiating with Susie and her mother about their money, asking them to give them their money, you know, threatening them with guns and stuff. And Susie was sitting there going, oh my gosh, you know, you better give them the money, Mom. And the mom and, and Trace was saying, I don't have it. You must have it. And they were going, oh, where's the money? Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, they, and don't get us killed. And they were going back and forth like this. And the whole time Susie was sitting on it, and she knew it. And the, finally what happened was the, the um, bandits got embarrassed. <laughs> They didn't know what to do next, <laughs> and they left. <laughs> next. <laughs> okay, to the, to the Kelly family. Uh, here's Daisy, and I love this picture of Daisy. This is Daisy in, uh, you know, probably her 80s. Um, she held salons in her old age and, uh, in, you know, held court in a, in a marvelous way. And that's how I guess she's probably about 14 or 15 in that other picture there. She was the Kelly's first daughter. And my, one of my favorite stories about her is going back to the fire I mentioned in 1870. She would have been 11 years old. She was born in 1859. She apparently went running into various houses and buildings that were, you know, trying to get people out, trying to help. And in the novel I'm working on, I have her running into the Carlson's Hotel because it's burning to save their dog. 
And it's one of my favorite parts of the book because <laughs> Daisy's like going into this burning building. And, but she had that kind of spunk. And she, you know, is responsible for the Mendocino Library by giving all of her books over there. They, this family loved to read. And, uh, and she traveled to Europe with her aunt. And she's just a fascinating lady. And next slide is her daughter, Jean. And Jean, uh, this is a young picture of Jean. Jean never married. She was the second child. She and her mother were really at odds. Uh, Jean refused to live with Daisy. There's all sorts of rumors and flying things around about what, what was the deal between Daisy and her mom. Why did they not get along? Why did Daisy hate her? I mean, why did Jean hate her mother? And she lived most of the time with Elise, which was her uh, aunt, Daisy's sister. And uh, Betty was telling me she's been doing helping me with some research lately, she told me that it's really interesting that when you look for the social, um, the sort of social articles that you see tons about Jeannie, who is, uh, who is her cousin, essentially, is Abigail's daughter, another one, a girl about the same age, was just a socialite in San Francisco. You see almost nothing about Jeannie. She's just kind of a mysterious young woman. We don't know really what her story was, but she never married. And I look at her face and I feel there's some tragedy there don't know what it is. Next slide. Elise, this is her, this is her aunt, this is Daisy's sister. Elise, this building is one of the buildings, one of the many buildings she owned. She married a guy named Drexler who was rich. He was a, a widower and <clears throat> very sought after. He didn't live very long after she married him. He was about 20 years older than he and she was, she just, she inherited his wealth. But before she ever met him, she was already wheeling and dealing. She was already buying and selling real estate. And that's what she did. She, she operated in the business world of San Francisco. When you look up things about her, you don't find her in the society pages. You find her in the business section. And this is the building where the Bank of America, originally the Bank of uh, Italy was, was, and she helped that, uh, Giovanni or whatever his name is, start that. She was the money, she, pardon me? Giannini. Giannini, thank you. She was the money behind it. She was working with him to get it started. She also went to Japan. I find that really amazing. And Nanny uh, re apparently reported that she was involved with a cult. At least that's how one of the people who Nanny communicated with reported it. And so I went hunting to see what cults that Elise might have been involved with. And I had just enough clues to discover that a Zen Buddhist had come to San Francisco in about 19, oh, I don't know, 1900, 1902, right around in there. And, and uh, he had a small gathering. There was a rich uh, socialite in San Francisco that hosted him. And there was a small gathering of people that, that clustered around him. And she was one of them. She studied Zen Buddhism. And that's why she went to Japan. The woman who had hosted him, he went back to Japan. They all went to Japan. She took Jean with her, which is really interesting. She took Jean McCallum with her to, to Japan. And I just find her a pretty fascinating woman. Next slide. Abby. This is Abigail Kelly Blair. Not as well known up here as the others. Abby was William Kelly's sister. She came out here a year after he did with her parents, with his parents. They were all here. And um, she settled, she married Captain Samuel Blair, who is one of my favorite characters, and Amy's too, in the book. And <clears throat> he was a ship captain and, and kind of a swaggery, kind of sexy guy, I think. Yeah, and <laughs> and she was a so she was the one who took all the girls to to Europe. Uh, she spent t at least two years in a row at one point in Paris. She went there many times. She loved Paris. As a matter of fact, her daughter Jeannie, who I was talking about, who had such a following of social, every time she, you know, walked out the door, somebody was reporting on it. Jeannie at least a Jenny least a place. Well, it's G E N N I E. I don't know Jenny Jeannie's. She leased a place in Paris on the Seine and, and lived there. And so Abby was this woman who, who uh, they were all born on Prince Edward Island uh, in Charlottetown, which was pretty, it was part of the British Empire at that point. It was a pretty kind of British sort of uh, civilized place. And they came out west. And, and that's, that's Abby as a young woman. And uh, next slide. Now this might be her daughter. It is. I saw this. I saw this up here in the corner, and I read it, and I said, "That says Jeannie McCallum." So there she is. That she's the young socialite. She's considered one of the pioneers of San Francisco. This is Abby's daughter, 
Um, and she's just written up all over the place. And she's the one who had the home in, in, in Paris for quite some time. And the Paris connection that I like the best is Augie Heiser wrote about all the women gathering in Paris. And I was in about eight, 1922, I think it was, somewhere right around there. Um, <coughs> and what had happened was, uh, I told you about um, Edith, the uh, woman who wanted to be the opera singer. She was over in Europe studying voice, along with her, her long-term friend and partner, Hannah Cowles. And her mother came, that would be Katie. And then her, Katie was the twin, and her twin came. So Katie and Bessie came, and Bessie's daughter, Edith, she was, I mean, Ethel, she was the one who was a pharmacist, came. And Daisy McCallum came, and they all met in Paris. And they had this rendezvous, and they all stayed at Jeannie's, Jeannie's flat that she was uh, leasing. This was after Abigail, her mother, was, had passed away. Um, they had all stayed at this flat in, uh, on the Seine. And either before or after, it's not clear to me exactly what the timing is, um, Jeannie, or Jenny, and Daisy went to Egypt together to the opening of King Tut's tomb. They didn't arrive at the exact day of the opening, but very shortly thereafter. And there's a really funny story about Daisy kind of crossing the boundary where you're not supposed to walk and jumping up and grabbing something and getting you. Oh. <laughs> it's 80-year-old woman at that point, or 75-year-old woman and getting yelled at for doing it. So she didn't change. And here's Eliza. I like this picture of Eliza. Eliza <laughs> Kelly. She arrived here. She was one of the first, um, first women here. Mrs. Ford was here, Mrs. Lansing, a few others. But one of the very first women here. And as you can see from that stern look, she was a very committed Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> She talked to her husband, who at one point had a saloon called Uncle Sam's that made the hair on the back of her ne hair ne neck go up, into building her the red church up here, which is now Corners of the Mouth, which was a Baptist church. She didn't like the Presbyterian church because they didn't let her play the piano there, for one thing. <laughs> and she didn't think they, you know, she thought that they didn't know the Word of God. <coughs> and uh, she led the temperance union. But she had heart. She had something really incredible. I, I'm sure she had great intelligence, too. You can see it in her eyes. And uh, I've become fond of her. I started to kind of put off by some of her stances. You know, I think if she was alive today, she'd probably be running around with the right wing and I'd be yelling at her. <laughs> but, but she had something. There's something that the more time I spend with her, the more she uh, gains my respect and affection. I think she was a very strong woman. She used to go riding all the time. And uh, she would ride out with Boucher. Boucher was the, the homo. And <coughs> William wouldn't let her ride alone, which makes sense. It was too dangerous to ride alone as a woman around here. And Boucher knew the land. He knew what he was doing. And uh, he used to carry Daisy in, a, in one of those um, packs on his back. What are those called? The, the boards at the yeah, like a papoose on his back, and uh, you know, I, I figure he taught her things like how to get the muscles out of the, out of the water and the clams and all of that. Taught her a lot, and uh, in my book, she talks to William's ghost all the time. She's one of the things I like about her. Next slide. Yeah, that's that's what I'm working on. That's just my version of the cover. And uh, I <coughs> I've talked too long. I brought some. Uh, I brought a little piece of it, but I've talked long enough, so I don't think I'll read from it. But um, I invite you to uh, ask me any questions you have, and thank you so much for coming out. <laughs> any questions? Yeah? What would have been the, uh, the path to Paris? How would they have gone to Paris in that time? Well, <laughs> they went, Abby, I, this was something that, uh, again, Betty helped me just the other day. I had said that Abby was, I knew that Abby was not in San Francisco when the earthquake hit. And so I de determined for my fiction that she must have been in Paris. It made sense to me. And I had her leaving uh, San Francisco. She would have taken a ferry from San Francisco to Oakland. And in Oakland, she would have gotten on the train and taken the train transcontinental to New York. And in New York, she would have gotten aboard a ship. 
and I had her leaving on April 13th. The, the, uh, Eliza, one of the most interesting stories about Eliza was she was in San Francisco. Everybody was living in San Francisco. Daisy was there and living on California Street. Elise was there. Abby was there. And Daisy had gone down, I mean, uh, Eliza had gone down, I suspect, to celebrate her birthday. And so she was in San Francisco. And something happened, and she got this feeling from God, she said, that she had to come back. And she insisted against everybody's saying you can't do that and got herself on an, on a ship and came back up to San Francisco or back up to Mendocino and arrived in Mendocino Bay the morning about you know 10 o'clock in the morning or whatever of the day before the earthquake so she was here for the earthquake the 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 house Daisy's house suffered uh, the chimney came down and a lot of damage and apparently didn't burn. I, I still am amazed that it didn't burn because it was on California Street, and I thought everything burned. But uh, there's some record that her house might not have burned. But Abigail's and, <coughs> and uh, Elise's were both destroyed. On, they were on Van Ness, and they were dynamited. And um, anyway, I, I found I had Abby leaving on April 13th. And when I found the actual information to, that, that Betty found for me, she literally left San Francisco on April 1st on her way to New York to Paris. And I had just made that up. And I was like, <laughs> I, I've been going right, right, right. That is so exciting. I just love it when things like that happen. So that's the, that's the route. It's a long, long trip. Any other questions? Yeah. Why do you think that the, particularly the women in this area back in those days, were uh, traveled so much? I know they had money, but you know you think we're in the, you know, uh, boondocks so to speak here now, and these women just traveled the world. They did. A lot of them did. Yeah, there were definitely world travelers. Because they came from. From PIE. From BIE. Oh, from Prince Edward Island. Yeah, the, a lot of them did come either from Europe or from the East Coast originally. Everybody was a pioneer coming out here in one way or another. And I've been reading, I don't know how many of you have already read this, but I've been reading The Angle of Repose by Stegner, mm -hmm. which is a, also a story about the West, about a woman who was raised in Connecticut in this very classy society where she was hanging out with, you know, uh, had, uh, Henry James gets mentioned, you know, she's hanging out in a circle of people and she married an engineer and came out here. It's based on a true story, actually, of a woman named Foote, who was one of the writers who isn't well known out here. But she came out here and she was, she never left, but there was that feeling, she would go back to the East Coast, there was that feeling of being torn between these two worlds. The West was, was an alien place compared to the East. It was the civilized nature of it. It was not a civilized place in the same way. And, and I think that, that um, there was prestige in traveling. I mean, in, first of all, in the 1800s, at the end of the 1800s, everybody was supposed to take their trip to Europe. You know, that was part of what the wealthy people did, what society expected of them, which is the kind of Henry James story. Traveling was not uncommon. It was almost a thing that you did because there were social seasons. Yes. There was a time to travel. There was a time yes. to get out of town and go down to Coronado in the San Diego area. Or, or Del Monte. They did. Yeah. I yeah. don't know yet what exactly the season was. I got one day that it may have started June 1st. I don't know how long it yet. Uh, it went yet. Um, but that's kind of a way of saying that's what was done. When yeah. You could afford it. Or we, right. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you, Molly. So <laughs>